Welcome back to Worth the Effort Woodworking and the beginning of a new series, or I'm going to call it a semester on the channel. And this one we are going to dedicate to the craft of wood turning. And I like wood turning, especially for new woodworkers who have none, never done any kind of woodworking because it is a subject all unto itself in the craft. But those of y'all that are doing other things like, you know, furniture making or carving or anything like that, this is something that could really augment it. So you could be a dedicated wood turner for your entire career, or this could be something ancillary that just kind of complements what you already do. And I like it because it is a very easy craft to learn and become successful in. It doesn't take a lot of physical skill. Anybody can do this. But despite that, I know people that can spend an entire career doing it and not master everything. There's always a new challenge. There's always a new way you can improve what you are doing. So it doesn't get boring. Now, I am kind of considering this a sophomore level course. I'm targeting to those people that might have a general foundation of knowledge that I can kind of build upon. Hence, if you're just a dead beginner or you're just getting back into the craft, I created a earlier series, an earlier semester that I'm calling the prerequisite course that goes all over a lot of the theories, the terminology, the ideas of woodworking, no matter which area you venture into the craft. And I'm going to base a lot of my lessons with the understanding that you have that little bit of knowledge. Now I'll put a link to that uh, series down in the description below. If you want to get into this first, peruse that to make sure you're going to understand what we're going to be talking about. Again, I'm kind of considering this a sophomore level class and that would have been the freshman level course. Now anytime I ever took a course, you know, that first day where a lot of time was just going over the syllabus and everybody introducing themselves. So, let's do that. My name is Sean Graham. I've been making YouTube content in the woodworking realm for over a decade now. Prior to that, I was a high school technology teacher. And I took up teaching woodworking over, over the, my summer break. And when I got left off, I went full time. I even tried to open up a woodworking school myself a while back. And for the past decade or so, a good portion of my income has been made from selling wood turn stuff that I make. So, now that you know me, how about you? Oh. You get the problem here? This is kind of a joke I've done at the very beginning of every single semester. This is not a two-way communication path. And teaching really demands two-way communication. A teacher really doesn't talk a lot about this. They draw information out of their students, even in a physical realm like this. You're questioning them and stuff like that. You're drawing the information out of them. You are modifying your lesson to your students' needs, to your students' understanding. You are constantly testing whether they comprehend what you are presenting. That is, none of that can, I can do through a camera. I mean, the best you can say is this is mainly an animated textbook. I'm just presenting the information and hoping you understand it. Now, I am going to do something quite a bit different on this particular series in an attempt to add a little bit of that two-way communication. Now, I'm going to be doing these every Thursday until the series is complete. And then on the following Tuesday, providing you a good weekend to absorb the information, maybe go out in your shop and uh, play around and do it, and develop some questions. That following Tuesday, I will do a live stream and answer all the questions that I come up from in the comments, and most importantly, on my Patreon channel. 
Uh, I'll put a priority towards them, and I'll discuss that a little bit more in a second. And then uh, after that, I will kind of unlist it so it's not going to be searchable because those kind of live streams kind of hurt channels. But I will put a link to it down in the description below. So if you can't make the live stream or if it's a couple years down the road and this series has been long completed, you can go back because more than likely the general audience is going to have the common questions that you have. And I'll be able to answer those in that Q&A session. Now, given all that, a Q&A after a anime textbook viewing is a poor substitute for being live in front of a good teacher, somebody that really knows what they're doing and knows how to teach it. So I would highly suggest if you're getting into this hobby, after you get a small foundation of basic knowledge, you know, just how to t hold tools and sharpen tools, go take some live classes or join a club and watch some demonstrations or go to symposiums, all that kind of stuff where an educator can watch what you're doing and maybe even offer answers to questions you don't know you needed to ask. That's the benefit of having a real teacher in front of you. This really is a poor substitute. But given all that, me demonstrating all this stuff to y'all in a shop like this, where we have not one, but two professional machines that are the, each would probably cost the price of a good, decent used car, and a decade of collecting lots of different tools and that kind of stuff, just doesn't seem that relatable. I mean, somebody could be out there saying, well, I could do that if I had this. So to put that out of all y'all's mind, I went out and bought a MIDI lathe just for relatability aspect because I think that's how a lot of y'all will go. A box is going to show up at your doorstep. You're going to pull out the tool and figure out how to use it. And in this video, we're going to use this unboxing as kind of a prompt. Go through the tools that we will be using in this course. And I want to tell you right now, it's going to be a very limited set of tools. Because I would much prefer you learn a new skill or a new technique to accomplish a task than going out and buying a one trick, a, a tool that's just basically a one trick pony. And me and my dad have kind of opposite viewpoints on that one. So a lot of the gouges and stuff you see around the shop are actually my dad's because I use a very limited set of tools myself. And I chose a MIDI lathe, M-I-D-I, versus a mini or kind of a semi-professional or full-size lathe, that kind of stuff, because I truly do believe that most wood turners, this will accomplish 99% of what they want to do in the, now and in the future. I mean, most wood turning does not need the high capacity, high horsepower motors. And this weighs enough and you can buy enough accessories to add to this to accomplish just about anything you want. But this was a pretty big capital investment for me. And I justify that because of the importance I place on an educator using the same caliper or hopefully the same exact tools as their students. But that kind of brings us to the topic of, of how I subsidize this kind of effort. Because I can look at this self as a value for value proposition. A lot like a street corner barker entertaining you. You're passing by. If they ha provide something of value for, for you, you throw a couple shillings into the cap. Well, if I provide a little bit of value for you, hopefully you can help subsidize future content creation for the next generation. And there are a lot of ways that you can do that one. Most importantly, liking, favorite, subscribing, because that all helps out the, the algorithms. You can even help a little, subsidize a little bit more financially by checking out all the swag we have and uh, the other ways I list of how to support us down in the description below, including a Patreon account. And those patrons, I will make a concerted effort to answer their questions first uh, in the uh, Q&As as kind of a perk for helping us out. Now, I did purchase a Jet MIDI lathe for the simple reason I think it, it, it's a good representation of the class, and I have a good history with Jet in that I personally have bought two mini lathes. I wore one out, and I'm still using, I recently sold the second one 
because dad also owns a mini lathe that he hasn't used as much so it's a little bit fresher uh, i've also spent a lot of time working off of a jet full-size lathe and a lot of my earlier videos you saw me using that one so i have a good history where i felt i've gotten good value from it but i'm not endorsing them or anything like that this is just a representation of the class because in the midi class m-i-d-i I do believe there's a lot of good competition out there. The other reason I bought is because at the time of purchasing, they were on sale. Oh, and if you are thinking about buying a lathe, for the first time in my 10 years online, I'm going to try some of these associate links, simply because I've, I've heard from a lot of content creators that I'm an absolute idiot for not doing it earlier. And what that means is I have links of tools that I would say I recommend for the simple reason that I might have been using them for a long time. And companies like uh, Amazon and other big box stores generally give a content creator, you know, a percentage or two with each purchase that comes from following those links. So if you're buying a lathe anyways and it won't cost you any more and you're using one of those companies, hey, that's an easy way to throw a few shillings our way. More information down in the description below. But, let's open up this puppy. So what came in the box obviously was the instruction manual, a tailstock with a live center already installed on it. We had our banjo and it had one tool rest in it. I will say uh, I was surprised that they went ahead and sent us a second tool rest. Uh, normally when I've gotten mini lathes from jet they only sent us one to arrest one that's kind of nice uh, we have a knockout bar and this is different and they're putting a screwdriver handle on them nowadays normally it was just a stick with a ball on the end uh, i don't know what this is uh, looks like a tool rack similar to the one they already have installed on this side but i'm guessing yeah, well, they gave us two screws already on this side so that you can add an extension. Remember me talking about MIDI lathes are very flexible. You can buy an extension. So if you want to turn something like baseball bats or uh, bed banisters or something like that, you can get two or three extensions all lined up and have a really long turning. Well, they included screws to add that extension on, I guess, I guess, no, these would only be for this. They're not long enough for anything else. But you would screw them on, on the end. And finally, we have a new, new tool to me. I'm not quite sure what this is for yet. Oh! It's so that you can get the faceplate off. Which, again, they included a faceplate, and you have a drive center already located in there I guess for easy packaging. You would never use those both at the same time. So the first thing you would do when you get pulling it out, obviously, is get rid of all the cosmoline or whatever that grease is and just give it a good cleaning. And at this point in time, I would probably go ahead and if you're going to, you know, lubricate the bed rails or something like that with wax or bosh, uh, or I think it's called bow shield or something like that to prevent rusting in the future, this would be the time to do that. 
Now, the faceplate they gave us is not a huge one. I, it's more, I would guess, just to say that they could market it, that they gave you a faceplate. But I do like the fact that this faceplate they have offers grub screws because that allows you to turn in reverse using a faceplate not have it not spin off. And we'll go in a lot more detail when we start talking about chucks and stuff like that. But the bad thing is we want to remove this so that we can use the screws and have easier access to work when we're using live centers, but it requires a grub screw. And they did not give you the tool to do that one. So, so on this particular model, you're going to need to ha have a set of uh, key, uh, uh, wrenches. And pretty much all lathes are gonna have some method of locking the, the head so that you can remove stuff. This particular one, it just has a little push button on this side, so you push it in and it finds a little hole right there, locked it in so you can twist stuff off. And that leaves us with the drive center. Now these are not attached with screws or anything, they're actually attached with something called a, a Morris taper, which is a very specific angle. And there are a couple Morris tapers we use in turning, they're generally located in the headstock and the tail stock. And uh, I, I wanna say this is number two, but I'm not 100% sure. That's what this bar that they gave us is for. So you can stick it in the back head unit, slide it in a hole and give it a good tap, preferably with a mallet so you don't damage the nerves in your hand. And notice that it just pops right out. Uh, that one was in a little bit lighter than I, the normal. So you don't want to just bang it out. Hopefully you will put a hand in front so you can catch it so you don't damage is ever important tip and we'll go over these a lot more in a second now why these manufacturers put on difficult to remove stickers i do not know but you're going to need some goo away or something to get off all that adhesive and that's going to be important later on down the road to lubricate my ways i'm just going to use a little wd-40 Spread it around, let it soak for, you know, half hour. I'm going to go edit this video while it's soaking, and when I come back, I'll give it a good wipe down and get rid of any of the excess. So now that you got it unboxed and kind of cleaned off, really take your time and go over every single inch of all the iron. Make sure there are no cracks that develop from manufacturing, anything like that. Take your paper towel or a piece of cotton, come over it and if you find any points that like snag a little bit a little sandpaper or mill file and you can kind of rub that out just to make sure the snagging that way when as a banjo moves across it's not going to hiccup so to speak also make sure that the ways are fairly flat flat get grab yourself a straight edge and do the angles and side to side making sure you don't have any major light sources. If you do, it's time to repack it up, send it back and get another one. Because those are errors that just can't be fixed and it will affect the placement of you know, your live center as you move it back and forth. It will rise and fall and you really do want these two points lined up which we will check in a second. Go ahead and grab your tail stock, drop it on, if the tailstock is too tight or loose so that you can't really move this uh, to loosen it up and move it around, well, there's a little screw on bottom that you can loosen or tighten. And it's kind of a trial and error setup. You just find a happy medium along the throw. I'm just going to loosen this one up a little bit, just a quarter turn. That will change how that slides on and off. That one minor adjustment means that the take up for wherever it starts getting traction is a little bit more on top of mine, which is what I like about it. Earlier, it was actually kind of starting to bind right about here, which means I didn't have much time to loosen it. I like to just be able to slap it down and make sure it's totally loose. And when I tighten it up, actually push forward. What you don't want to do is be able to push it so it bangs into a stop, like this one right here has a stop right there because in the future you're going to want to uh, use the this low lever which moves the quill back and forth to tighten it up and if it gets to the point where it's just kind of it can't tighten up enough 
what happens is as you're moving this fo the quill forward, it just moves the tailstock back and you never get the piece tight in between centers. You just want to be able to really lock it down so you can squeeze tight on here. So in the future, if your tailstock is moving back a little bit, maybe an adjustment on bottom of that one screw will help you out. So once that's done, go ahead and slide it back and forth. Make sure it's not going to catch on anything and it slides smoothly. And that's where that lubrication really helps out. Next, go ahead and find your drive center and go ahead and pop it into the headstock. And now we're going to move the tailstock. And what you want to do is bring these forward so that they, the two tips touch. Can you see that right there? They're make, perfectly lined up this way and up and down. So you're going to want to look at it from the top and bottom. Now, if it is not perfect right here, go ahead and rotate this to make sure that it isn't an error with this piece or this piece, because they, those should not move as they rotate around being perfectly centered. Then you also want to kind of take your quill Move, tighten this little lever so it's ever so slightly and move it back and forward and then test it again. Move it back a little bit, test it again. Move it back a little bit, test it again. That makes sure that the manufacturing of the quill has it perfectly parallel with the bed lays and in line with here. Any discrepancy here and then you need to contact the manufacturer and either get a replacement or figure something out. And this is a fairly common problem I see with inexpensive lathes out there. They just aren't perfectly aligned and if they aren't perfectly aligned, your piece is always going to be kind of wobbling, especially if you uh, move it back, then reset it after it rotates a little bit. It, it's just, it's a high frustration if your two, their tail stock and the, live, the, the drive center do not line up perfectly. So now let's talk about the tail stock. Uh, the head stock is a drive unit. This, the tail stock is a mobile unit. It's basically made up of a quill that moves back and forth and it's probably going to have a lot of crap on it from the manufacturer. Now, most of the lathes I use, it has a kind of a stop as you get towards the very end so it can't go any farther. Can you see that? It's not moving very far. I did notice on this one, I can just remove the entire quill and you can see it's just a thread on bottom that, uh, you know, this is a thread over here and it just moves it back and forth. I'm not sure the advantage of being able to remove this this easily, but it will make, I guess it easier to clean it out to make sure it moves smoothly. Now on one side you will notice it has a little square unit and on the other side of the tailstock you have this little lever that kind of squeezes in there because there is some slop in the unit. Now a machinist will, can tell you why but this cylinder is actually ever so slightly smaller than the hole so that it will slide in and out easier. There's a little bit of a tolerance, I guess you would say, for allowing it to go. Now, this particular one does have a ruler in there. In all my years of wood turning that ruler, I never use that ruler. It's somewhat irrelevant. But being able to get your tailstock at the distance you want out and then being able to lock it with this lever, notice that little looseness totally goes away and that locks this perfectly slightly loose and it wiggles that doesn't sound like a lot but it'll be a source of frustration when you're turning so when you're ever using your quill you generally want to lock it or if you're moving it back and forth get it really snug so you can just barely move it without that sound. Now to get the, the live center out and swap it out for other ones, all you do is totally retract it and generally there's going to be a bar in the inside that will push your live center out. 
Now, some of them will have it. Evidently, this model doesn't. So we're going to have to use the knockout bar. It goes in the hole. Hold your hand there. Just give it a few whacks, and it'll knock it right out. You do want to hold it because the, when these things pop out, that little point right there, they are replaceable on some live centers, but not on this one right here. You just have to get a whole new unit if you damage that point. Now, personal preference, I don't really like these little handles they have out here. I find it gets in the way. I will just grab this and twist it as I move it. So I'm going to remove mine. And it's got a little hole in the center that you can put a nail in just to rotate around and unscrew it. Now, maintenance on these is obviously that screw on bottom. Occasionally, you'll have to take rust off this bottom section right here to allow it to slide smoothly because... You know, if you turn green wood, there's a lot of water involved. Uh, so that just kind of gets caught up on there. And green wood creates wet sawdust. So occasionally you're going to have to come over and take the quill out, uh, especially if you spend a long day turning green, and just clean out this entire section because sawdust gets in there all the time. And if it's not moving smoothly, it's generally sawdust on the screw it's coming through it. So take this out, clean out the threads right here. Maybe it's a toothbrush on the inside to clean those threads, reassemble it. And this grease that they put on it, I've always found just attracts sawdust and makes life a little bit harder. Grease on the threads, okay. Grease on the slides, not so much in my opinion. Now, in almost all lathes I've ever used, both the headstock and the tailstock use something called Morris Tapers to lock things in. And this will really lock in when it's under pressure. And it's just this taper right here. Now, and it's abbreviated MT2 or MT3 or MT1. And that will affect the accessories you buy. For example, my one-way lathe has a different Morris Taper than this one right here. Yeah, it's bigger, but it's it's the angle that they're talking about. This particular one has a MT2 on both ends, which does mean that you can buy accessories, such as a Jacob's Chuck, which we'll cover later on, that will fit in both ends. And you saw just me tapping that in there made it tight enough so it sticks. So I need to get the knockout bar to knock it out. And that knockout bar on this particular model is not quite long enough to knock it out when it is fully extended. So I have to bring the quill back. Because there will be times where you want to put a Jacob's Chuck holding a bit or something like that and have it be driven by this end. And there will be other times you might want to put it in here and have the drill bit still with the piece turning. Uh, it's just different options. So you can buy a Jacob's Chuck, and they offer different Morse Tapers adapters. Again, we'll go over more of this later on. So now let's talk about the banjo, which holds your tool rest. I don't know why they call it a banjo. But one thing is, you want to make sure that it is dead flat on both rails. Otherwise, it will not move evenly. So this is the time to check it. And once again, if there are any issues... You know, maybe take some sandpaper and see if you can get off any kind of rough burrs or anything like that. But if it's way off, it's time to call a manufacturer and either see what they can do for you to get your replacement. And just like on the tailstock, you have a screw right here that can adjust how it is tensioned. Me personally, I like to get it set so whenever it's parallel with the ground, and I can just kind of push down on it, that locks it in. If it goes past parallel, I need to tighten it up a little bit. And what this is, it's a little same setup, lock, and it just slides on a bar that's somewhat off-center, so it moves up and down as you rotate the handle around. Now the banjo holds your tool rest. And uh, common sizes for tool rests, this is a 5 8 inch, which just so happens to be the same as a mini, mini uh, lathe that Jet makes. That's kind of a common size for uh, 
midi size. They go up to one inches or even bigger for other manufacturers or bigger sizes and just the amount of pressure you can do. They have a little lock screw that allows you to move it up and down and then you lock it down. And this can be adjusted by pulling it out and moving it over to get different angles. Because a lot of times I don't like it right here or up here because it gets in the way of my hand moving across. So you, you'll adjust it, then you'll pull it out and move the handle to a different position so it's not in your way. And once again, really examine your tool rest closely to check for any kind of cracks. These generally are iron when they come from the manufacturer and this will be taking a lot of abuse, especially these longer ones when you're extending way out here, you got your tool rest down, there's any kind of banging or you get a catch, there's a lot of pressure on here. So any cracks within here will cause, well, it'll cause it to break. You also want to make sure if you ever drop these to re-examine them because they are iron so they can crack fairly easily with a heavy hit. So this is something just to take, take in account and we'll cover this a lot more in a second. Next, let's talk about the headstock. This particular one has a, a one inch headstock and what's strange is even though this is uh, made in China, stuff like that, a lot of the headstocks and thread counts are imperial. This is a one inch headstock with a one in eight thread count, meaning for every one inch, you're going to have eight threads. And that's important if you're, when you're buying accessories, such as chucks and stuff like that. Because if you, get, if you have multiple lays, it's really nice to have the same uh, thread count headstock set up. For example, this one is the same as my mini lathe, which will make parts accessory interchanging uh, a lot easier. You can, if you do get a different accessory you can swap out these uh, adapters right here for the different uh, thread counts in the future again we'll cover that more later i did uh, talk earlier about this locking mechanism evidently that's just a quick lock almost all lays are going to have a way to lock it down this particular one has two versions that quick lock which is going to be a nice accessory just for removing the headstock and then they have one that's indexed over here, so this one has 24 index slots, and that comes into a nice account if you do like segment turning or you're doing carving, you want to get even holes around. There's a lot of different instances where having a specific index, which stops the rotation at a specific spot, and you can screw it down to lock it in that position makes, makes sense. I will say this, a lot of times there have been instances where I've actually screwed this down and I've turned it on and you'll hear a squealing and that's just the belt and the motor slipping because of that lock pin. So if it's not turning, one of the first things you want to check is make sure you don't have the index screwed down. Now this particular model is a variable speed, which we'll get to that in a second, where it's, the speed can ramp up and slow down via the motor. But you also have gears like on a bicycle. This one has three gears. So in high gear, you'll go, it starts at its lowest speed is 220 RPMs and goes up to 3600 RPMs. In low gear, it goes from 50 to 90. And if you're turning big items like bowls, obviously you're going to be using the low gear because it's going to offer you more torque. This is kind of like those speeds that will get you up a hill and you don't have to pedal eat too hard on a bicycle. Whereas if you're in high gear going up that hill, you really have to put a lot of power into it and it'll call, cause problems. Um, there was a, a time where I was on a one speed lathe and it was in a, they had put on a high gear on it and I tried to turn a bowl. What happened was the motor would bog down and then it would ramp up the power to that motor to try and pick the speed up and it would ramp it up too much because I'd obviously taken the tool off of the, the cutting edge off of the bowl so it decreased the resistance and it would spin that bowl up to that 3600 RPM, which was dangerous. So it would go from 200 down to 3600 really, really quickly. So these speeds are important for the size of work you're doing, because if you get them wrong, it can interact with the variable speed motor inappropriately. 
basically the bigger the piece the lower the gear you need to be if you're turning a pin or something really thin you can go on a high speed now this hand wheel is kind of an overlooked aspect of lathes but it becomes so important in daily use or consistent use that i know a lot of people that will make custom ones out of wood just to make make the operation a lot easier for them because you will be constantly spinning it and a lot of times if it's spinning down i'll come over and squeeze a little bit to slow it down you just want to make sure that there's no burrs or no, nothing that's going to catch on your skin and cut you you want this really really smooth but size so it will fit in your hand easily so just so you can twist it around i know some people put handles on the outside don't do that one it, it will smack you because you are going to be touching this quite a bit. Directly below the headstock, you're going to have another set of gears. Now, not in small lays like this one, that's also where the motor is. It's just a direct drive off the motor. Sometimes you're going to have another motor out over here on vintage ones. Well, you have another belt going over here. That gives you more gearing options. And this is just like a bicycle. If you have a small gear up here and a big gear down here, well, the small gear has to turn a whole bunch of times to keep up with one turn of the big gear. But if you have a big gear up top and a small gear on bottom, this gear will turn a whole bunch of times and this one will just turn a few times to keep up. And that's kind of like on a bicycle, you know. If you're in the big gear on your crank levers and a small gear on the back, you're going to go really, really fast because your crank's turned once, but your rear wheel has to turn a whole bunch of times to keep up and inverse small gear up front big gear on back you got to turn your pedals multiple times for your rear wheel to turn once and that won't allow you to get up a hill easier now to do these you have some kind of release of the belt it has one of those levers that you can pull the handle out to change its location for engagement where you can either tighten it up or loosen it and that will allow you to lift the motor up to release the tension. Oh, this one has a kind of gear mechanism. Most of them, it's just a, a little twist nut lever. And what that does is allow you to lift up the motor, which releases the tension on the belt so that you can move it. And when you're moving these belts, you always want to go from the big pulley down to the smaller pulley. So if you're going down, you would obviously move the bottom first so that you can then move the top one over. And what a lot of times I'll do is I'll move it over a little bit and I'll use a hand wheel just to rotate it around. But if you were to move it this side up, you won't have enough flex to get it onto the bigger gear until you move it over to the next smaller size on the bottom wheel. And then you can move this one over and you know rotate it around to get it through. If you're going the opposite way, you've got to move the top first to the smaller gear so that then you can then move it to the bigger gear on bottom. And you, if you ever get in a situation where you turn your lathe on and it squeals like a rabid banshee, what that means is you forgot to re-tighten up the motor, the belt, by either lowering the motor or some kind of cam mechanism if the motor is off to the side. You got to put a little bit of pressure on that belt in order for it to fully engage. It's a friction that's going to drive those wheels. Now, one note, most lathes I know of nowadays, these gears, they're made of aluminum or, you know, some kind of alloy. In the old versions, they were made out of, you know, iron and steel. I do personally believe that those old heavy iron and steel ones were better than these uh, because they had mass that kept going smoothly. So it just kind of translated into smoother turning on your lathe when you were kind of getting more resistance, less resistance. It just kept things moving smoother. But having a lighter weight gears on top and bottom just means that it requires less motor to spin them up quickly. So on these lower horsepower motors, this one being a one horsepower, I guess that kind of makes sense. It just means it's not going to be as smooth when you're turning versus the older, heavier weight gears. Now that you've gotten every check to make sure everything's tightened, go ahead and grab here 
And if you hear anything when you're putting pressure down, that means there's some kind of uh, tolerances issue. It's time to call a manufacturer and get a replacement or see what they are going to be doing. Once again, you know, there are some stores that sell very low priced lays that you can go in there and you just kind of do this and you hear it click, 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 walk away. Now let's just talk about motors. Uh, this particular one, I'm just using this as an example, is a one horsepower motor. I do know that my mini lathe is either a three quarters or a half horsepower motor. And at that uh, horsepower in the United States, we're generally at a 60 hertz on the power lines. It's going to draw six amps in order to uh, power up the one horsepower motor. That's what it's rated at. Understand you will probably get a, a spike above that six amp load when you're first starting it and uh, first starting it or if there's a heavy load for a short amount of times. And I'm not an electrician, but I've kind of gone on the assumption that it's like 1.5 times your amp, max amp rating whenever it's loading up. So budget twice as much. What that means is uh, for this six amp motor, I would probably want at least a 12 amp circuit and the smallest that we install in most uh, um, outlets in this country, the United States, is a 15 amp circuit. So 12 amps is a pretty big portion of a 15 amp circuit, which means that if you have anything else on that circuit, such as maybe an overhead light, a fan, or heaven forbid, a dust collector that you want to run at the same time, obviously that will likely blow that circuit whenever you're starting this thing up. Running it, you know, it'll run consistently lower than six amps, but it's the startup where it kind of uh, uh, spikes on you. There are going to be some motors that are also going to be three phase. This is one phase, which means it's very, you know, just plug and play into a 110 outlet. But if you have a three phase motor that's converted to use a 110 outlet or a one phase circuit, you're going to have some other electronics on your lathe that could go wrong or might need maintenance in the future or you're going to have to pay for in the initial order. It'll all be wrapped up in the price. So getting the proper motor to be used on the power that you have in your shop is important. Me personally, if I had a choice, I would put this on a 20 amp circuit so that maybe I could have a spotlight, an LED light, and that would be the only thing running on that circuit. Also, if you are not able to put your lathe right next to the wall where your socket is and you have to run an extension cord, run the shortest extension cord you can to get to that wall socket. Don't, if you're, if you're only three or four feet away from the wall socket, don't put it on a 200 foot extension cord because you're just going to blow the circuit. Something about the amp load, the longer the cord is. I don't know the technical aspect of it. Just don't do that. Now let's talk about the power unit, the on-off switch, so to speak. You know, you turn it on, it ramps up to whatever speed you have it on. One thing I really like about the MIDI class and above, it's very common for it to have a forward and reverse function on it. Uh, most mini, M-I-N-I's, only have a forward function on it. And that just offers you a lot of flexibility, and we'll get into that a little bit more. But one thing I want you all to understand is get in the habit of whenever you turn your lathe off, you do not want it to go wide full open the moment you turn it on. For if you are coming off the lathe at the beginning of the day, you chuck up a rough piece that's in balance, and it goes straight to 3,600 RPMs, chances are it's going to be go flying. So I just got, have gotten in the habit that every time I turn my lathe off, I put the speed down to the lowest. Because worst case scenario, you're turning something thin and balanced. Oh, you have to turn the speed up. No big deal. But nothing bad is going to happen if a thin, balanced piece turns slow. Something bad will happen if a big, unbalanced piece turns fast. So just get in the habit. Off button, rotate it down no matter if the switch is located towards a tailstock, which I perf perf prefer because I'm not reaching over my work very often, versus one that is on the headstock.
And what I mean by that is most of the time when I'm working on bowls or something like that, I'm standing to this side of the headstock so things are going on. So if something goes wrong and I want to turn the machine off, I don't want to have to reach around here. I want to be in the safe zone and flip a switch. And a lot of layers have a adjustment over here, but they might have an auxiliary adjustment that you can purchase on a little magnetic switch. It's just the on-off button that you can put over on this side so that you're in the safe area when you shut it down. So that's all the main hardware that you know comes with the lathe. So now let's talk about the accessories and the accessories they provided with this lathe, starting with the drive center. Now what came with the lathe is a spur drive. And I will tell you this, this is my favorite type of drive. It comes with a center spike, which actually holds it pretty tightly in between centers. And that's all they used to use in the old days. It's just a center spike and they would wrap cord around the wood and it would just spin on this one. That center spike is what keeps it stable. So you really want to protect that to make sure it doesn't get damaged. And then you have these teeth on the outside that really bite in. Uh, but they can bite in so much that it doesn't allow the wood to slip. And if you ever get something called a catch, this is one of the reasons why it doesn't back its way out. Also notice how it is angled. So if it ever goes backwards, it can kind of slide out because of that curve, but it really bites this way. Now there are a lot of varieties of these, and these are my preferred ones. I know my dad, when he's turning bowls, he likes to do a, a spur drive that only has two teeth on it because it allows a little bit of flex for the bowl blank lining it all up out there. And notice it is quite a bit bigger. I prefer one that I leave in my that I can put into my chuck. And it's quite a bit bigger, but once again, it has a center spike. And whenever I'm not using it, the, my chuck just stays on my lathe all the time. So this way, you know, I don't have to take it off. I just chuck that up and I can use it like a normal lathe. Now, all of these have either a number two or probably a number three would be the most common Morris tapers. And they're different sizes and stuff like that. And that will really bite in. You can also, on some of them, replace this tip, or the tips might be spring-loaded so that they will re retract a little bit in. A variation of this type of drive is what they call a multi-tooth drive center. I'm just showing this to you so you know what it is, but it works really well if you have a nice flat surface for it to rest against. Something like that, will, it can bite all the way around. Whereas something like this, if just one or two of these can bite in, it'll spin the work. So if your work is not quite even, but you had the center spike going into the wood a little bit, and these teeth biting in, it will still spin it. This kind of re requires flatter surface. But some people really do like it because the teeth don't go in that far. If you're doing green wood on something like this, you can drive it into the wood quite a bit so it will bite in. This, it'll slip on green wood after a while because it's just not digging in that far. And it's got this flat, I guess you could call it a sole that will push back so a lot, not allow it to push too much farther in. Now, new woodworkers a lot of time like something called a cup drive. These are all accessories you can buy after the fact, remember, it comes with this one right here. Now, cup drive, notice it has no spikes. It's just a center cup. And if you see how it bites in, you know, it just leaves that little circle indentation. Can you see that right there? It's friction that goes in. And some people call cup drives safety drives for this reason. With a cup drive, because there's no teeth biting into it and the only uh, grip it has is a friction of the ring, if for some reason you get a catch, it'll actually stop. Like that. Even if you speed it up, it'll stop. So it's quite a bit less scary. But the downside is if you just, you know, a little bit of pressure and it's constantly doing this kind of action. And I don't like that. So you end up constantly tightening it up over and over and over. 
as you can see in the spot it does, it just spins in that circle. What a lot of people will do is they will remove that center spike, which you can do with this style, and then they take a mill file. Let me see if you, I can zoom. Well, that's as close as I can zoom in. And they just, they'll start out cutting one all the way across with a triangle five, and it creates this little tooth right there. Can you see that little tooth? And then they'll try it out. And if they want a little bit more grip, they'll do another cross section creating a triangle. And then they'll keep adding triangles until they get it to the way they like it. But this is never going to be the, the drive that gives you the most traction. It's always going to allow for a little slippage, which in certain situations when you're learning, that might be advantageous. A lot of times they start kids out on these things because you're less likely to get hurt. Me personally, I like my bits to really, really bite. So in actuality, what I will do is I will find the center of my work when I'm doing stuff. And before I put it on the lathe, I will actually hit it with a hammer, hit it like that, to make sure I get a really good bite in. The other kind of drives are, as we showed you earlier, face plates. And basically they thread on and you have the grub screws on this one so you can spin it both forwards and backwards. The problem with going backwards is as, as you turn off your lathe, these things might have some momentum and that momentum will carry and it will just spin off the threads because when you're turning backwards, you're going in the direction of the threads. The grub screws just prevent that. And they give you a bunch of uh, holes in them. Most of the time they are all kind of recessed because they're designed for wood screws. I will say this, don't keep reusing the same screws over and over and over for years. Get in the habit of buying really good screws. If you go to some place like Fastenal, they'll give you good options for which ones to choose. And then buy enough so that every week or so, if you're using it a lot, you can swap them out. And make sure they bite into the wood quite a bit of ways so that you'll get a good bite. I really don't know why these are not recess unless they were giving you the option of using a uh, flat head screws for these which I'm not sure why they would do that one. Now because I use chucks so much in my woodworking instead of face plates you end up kind of collecting them and I love them because you can basically attach them to something like a piece of MDF put sandpaper on it and all of a sudden turn your lathe into a disc sander or if you like sharpening Go ahead and, you know, round over a piece of MDF. You can put some polishing compound on it and then glue on some leather and you all of a sudden have an electric strobe that you can attach right there. So face plates allow you to do a lot of accessories that turn, make the, your lathe a little bit more multifunctional. You can also use, make jigs out of it like this vacuum chuck right here, which you put a vacuum on this side and it will hold a lot of flat work with a good seal right there so you can turn like the bottoms of bowls off and stuff. So while I say I don't use face plates very often, it's one of those deals where I use them in jigs and other appliances, not necessarily for the wood I am turning. And the last drive side that you could think about would just be a solid piece of wood. If you have like an MDF or piece of plywood, you can drill a hole in them and buy a tap for that one in eight uh, thread count on a one inch hole. That way, just drill a hole, tap it, and you can put the board right on the lathe and then you can screw anything you want to it, be it a, another bowl, another piece of wood to turn, or jigs or stuff like that. Uh, Instead of a face plate, just getting one of these pretty much gives you an infinite number of face plates that you can make out of the MDF and plywood. You also have the option of using a mandrel, which is where you drill up a hole in a piece of wood, then you can thread that wood right on here, and this goes in your drive center, the Morris taper will really grip, and then your tailstock or your live center will go into a hole right there, and you can squeeze it in there and turn that. That's how you make pins. Next up, I want to talk about chucks, which you thread onto the headstock and they become the drive center. You might have noticed in my turnings, I very rarely don't have a chuck on it, even if it is just holding a drive spur. I just like the idea of putting a chuck on my lathe and letting its versatility 
allow me to use it for the same things that other things do. And you can see they have different things that you can put in, grip in with your chuck, you know, your drive spur. Here's a screw drive, which is something where you just drill a hole in a piece of boards, thread it on, make sure it seats very firmly on the edge, and there's your drive action. Uh, then what I have right here is an example of three different sizes in one manufacturer. This is all from One Way, a Canadian company. Now I'm going to tell you I'm a bit of a chuck snob and it isn't because I'm doing it for name brands or something like that. It's just through experience I have found that spending a little extra money and getting a premium chuck from a long-standing brand name such as One Way or Vicmark, really the two only two brands of chucks I can recommend their entire catalog, uh, you're going to get a lifetime investment, a lifetime tool. In fact, none of these here did I uh, buy new. These were all acquired used. They have years and years of life in them and they've been out for long enough and I hate to say it the baby boomer generation is kind of leaving the craft for one reason or another so there are a lot of older ones out there and especially the one-way styles they kind of become the standard so a lot of accessories that work with these work with other manufacturers stuff so it's everything is just kind of centered around those two brands one-way or Vicmark I have owned other brands in the past. Uh, my dad has passed some of those other brands down to me because neither one of us really like them. They just kind of, they get loose over, t they're, they're just not as nice. It's one of those things that you don't ever think about these where the other ones you were kind of cursing them every now and then. And most chucks you can get jaws of different sizes. Obviously this is going to grab a much bigger tenon than this and the difference is the different jaws also the bigger the chuck the more weight it can handle and stuff like that but for the size of stuff you will be doing on this caliper lathe the smallest one-way chuck uh, which i think they call this a scroll their scroll chuck or the standard one-way chuck more than what you need one step up from that one is actually just the same capability, but it has a different kind of uh, mechanism to tighten and lower it. This one uses two bars. This one uses a little screw handle. And then the Stronghold, which is their biggest version, also uses a little screw handle to open and close the jaws. I can't stress this enough. If I was getting accessories for my lathe or different things, the very first accessory I would buy would be a good chuck. Now when you mount a chuck, this distance right here has to be non-existent. Go ahead and give it a good seating mechanism so now it, it actually takes some stiction for you to loosen it up. I mean, you had to kind of really get after it to now loosen it. Any kind of gap anywhere in here will induce vibration. And the farther out you are from the chuck, the more it's going to vibrate. A little vibration right here translates a lot out here. So you just have to get that really tight. And that connection right there is one of the things that makes a good quality chuck good, superior than a lot of the stuff that's out there. Uh, even if any kind of feeler gauge that you can fit in there is too much. Once you get that down, go ahead and tighten up the grub screws so that if you spin this backwards, it is not going to spin off on you. Because if you thought those face plates had a lot of momentum, these things right here can weigh a couple pounds and you don't want that spinning off the lathe. Now I want to talk about the tool rest because this is your connection with the lathe. Whenever you are turning, I know a lot of times you will see people turning where they're not even touching anything other than the tool on the lathe. In reality, you want your hand connecting here, and that gives you all your control. All of a sudden, your depth gauge is right here. Your control for pivot point is right there. If you're back here, you're trusting that your 
advanced ambidextrous uh, physical coordination controls all those aspects as you fight a one horsepower motor. Right here, all you have to worry about is moving the back of it. Hence, this little lip on tool rest is really important because you want to be able to slide your fingers on it, which is one reason why I don't like a lot of the ones that come from the factory because they are very rough. And if you spend all day moving your hand back and forth on that one, you just wear off your skin right here. Plus the fact that they never seem to finish these and notice that you had this pivot point. Click, 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 click because of that flat. So listen to this. I've got my 3 8 inch gouge. Because right at this angle, it changes in the pivot point. So if you're adjusting stuff, it might be hitting there. It's not a favorite feature of mine. But I also want you to listen to this. You hear that? That's because there's lots of rough mill marks on this stuff. So the very first thing you need to do, especially with these iron ones, is take a mill file to them. I wouldn't use sandpaper. Really use a nice flat mill file and take off and smooth it out. Get rid of all those machining marks. That is something you're going to have to do quite often if you have a iron tool rest because it will dent on you. And any kind of undulation, even those mill marks. So now, hear how much smoother that is? There's no resistance for gliding. I can even do that a little bit more to make it smoother. You want that smooth action. When you get a little dense, all of a sudden you've got this little hiccup and that will translate into a not smooth surface on your work. Hence, my second upgrade to a lathe would be to put this in the dumpster <laughs> or just set it aside so that if you ever sell this lathe, uh, you can sell it with it. In fact, uh, I still have the original one to one of my old mini lathes that I hadn't even scuffed up or scratched yet because the very first thing I do is pick up some nice tool rests ones that have a smooth back section so that my fingers can just glide along the back. There's only one pivot point of these and they are a very hard steel where this steel will dent more before this steel will. And you just, I mean, so much more control without that click, 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 click as you're moving across stuff and sliding along your fingers. I mean, you're not going to it's not sandpaper across your knuckles, just very nice. These are actually made by uh, Robust. It's one of his top selling uh, tools. And you can get them in a variety of sizes. I would, if I were getting them, I would probably get one six inch one and one really long one. The long one is for spindle turning, long like wands and stuff like that. And this one is good for getting inside corners of bowls and stuff. Uh, they aren't cheap, but they're lifetime investments. Where this, you're constantly milling it back and stuff like that, you end up rebuying them if you turn a lot. Now, I'm just going to show these to you. I don't use this type of tool rest, but these are some of my dad's uh, more used tools when he's turning bowls. Because as you can see, it can get inside a bowl and you're never really hanging far off the edge as you go around a corner. Whereas if you have a straight tool, sometimes as you move the corner, you're going to go a little bit farther off in the middle and then come back like that. So it's a variation of the torque that's happening to the back of the handle. So some people will believe that they get a kind of a smoother cut this would be for like the outside of the bowl if they can keep the tool at a consistent depth uh, i've never really used this type but i wanted to at least show it to you so you know that option is out there and they come in all different kinds of shapes some of them are little s's and stuff like that now let's move down to our live centers 
and they call them live centers because this is squeezed in the Morse taper, so it's never going to move anywhere, but most of them are set up on ball bearings. And in the old days, they were just solid, and they would put something, some kind of oil or grease on that tip to create some lubrication so it could spin around. Uh, these just rotate. Uh, this is a nice investment of upgrading later on down the road. Uh, I haven't found a factory one that will last a whole long time because the bearings are right here and just even though they're sealed and they should never need lubricating, sawdust sometimes how it gets in there and they just eventually wear out. The ones that come from the most factory ones are kind of inexpensive. The key thing though is the biggest problem I have is dropping these and bending that tip right there. Once that tip is bent, it no longer centers itself perfectly and it adds frustration. Now, there are two main styles of live centers. Uh, the one that comes with our lathe is probably the more common style and it's a style my dad prefers. It's called a cup live center. And basically, you have that po ever important point right there. And that will go into like a little all hole to center it. And that's what gives you your stability. It's not moving backwards and forward because of that spike. But you want to be able to put pressure on it this way. So you advance the quill and it kind of squeezes in between the two centers. Well, if you didn't have that cup right there, that spike would just drive into the wood like a nail. That cup right there kind of puts a lot more pressure on the end grain so it can't come back this way as far and you can put a lot of pressure on your uh, wood with that kind of live center. The other style is what they call cone and I apologize I cannot find the cone live center that works with my mini lathe which would also work here. This one goes to my one way which has a different Morris tape prop and that's why it looks so much bigger but it just has a center point. And the difference is the angle of that center point is quite a bit steeper, but not that much. You would think that if you continue to press it into it, it would split wood like an ax, but I've never had that happen. And you can put a lot of pressure on with these. The reason why I like this style more than the other style is that when I am turning, and I have this in here because of that cup, I can't get into it, get really close to that center line. Whereas with this style, my tool can come in real close. Granted, the thinner down you get, the less this thing is providing support, but there's always trade-offs. I prefer that added control so I can come down really tight at the very end of my turning. And once again, you always have the option of putting something dead on the end and by that I mean something like a Jacob's Chuck which isn't going to rotate it's just going to be locked in so that whatever piece that's rotating around on the lathe will counteract with a, a dead end and huh earlier in this video I was telling you you could take these uh, live centers out by just backing it off well guess what you can, even on this model. You back it off, see how it just kind of pushes it out because there's something in there pushing it out. The reason why it wasn't working on that end live center is notice that the end of the Morris taper on this one right here is hollow and this one is somewhat solid. So this one ha actually had some material that that little pin could bump up against. I don't know why they would even put this in your toolkit if that was a case. Why? I don't get it. So there's we go. A really in-depth overview of our main tool we use in wood turning. And I want you to think about that. That's it. You can fit that in the corner. I did this in the corner of an efficiency apartment for years. Just tucked it away, cleaned up after I made the mess. Uh, but it's not that much. And yes, there are a lot of other accessories you can buy. But for this series, what I'm going to be doing is trying to reduce the tool load. Yes, I am going to have an accessory chuck. And yes, I am going to use a robust tool rest just because I hate that factory tool rest. I hate, hate, hate it. And we will probably do, have some applications where I will use a Jacob's chuck. 
But other than that, pretty much everything came with the initial purchase that we really need to get started other than the gouges. And for that, I'm giving you some homework because I did a pretty in-depth video on four different types of cuts that we do on the lathe. That was the planing, the peeling, the scraping, and the slicing. And you don't need a lot of tools to do those four cuts. And I have a video called Four Cuts. That's your homework. Before the next video in this series, I would appreciate it if you would at least peruse that one so that I can talk about the other gouges and stuff like that and the applications that we use them for. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. It was a long one, but I'm sure you have a lot more in-depth knowledge of the tool we will be using. And I want you to remember one last thing as we end this class, that it is always worth the effort to learn, create stuff, and share it with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.